Lord, we just ask you for for your heart in the situation, Holy Spirit. We ask you for simplicity and clarity on the scriptures, God, that you would just help us get inside of them and understand them, not not for some just theoretical ideas, but actually to be able to to lead people in truth and righteousness, to be able to affirm the Jew in his calling, to affirm the Gentile in his calling, and to keep order and peace, like Paul says in Romans 14, that that we pursue that which makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding God. So we ask you to help us in this way, uh, be able to affirm each one is calling in Christ's name. Amen. So, um, so you have in Paul in Galatians, in Galatians 2, a clear delineation between the, the, the apostolic calling between the Gentiles versus the Jew, with Paul going to the Gentiles and Peter going to the Jews. And Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 9 that you get the same feel as in Romans 14, where Paul, who's mature in faith, considers these things to be not important to salvation and that there should be grace among Jew and Gentile between one another in the midst of the fellowship, and that so he can go to a Gentile and he can eat with the Gentile without conscience, and he can work and probably made tents on the Sabbath with Gentiles without conscience, but then when he's amidst Jews, he's obedient to the law without conscience because in both situations he knows that neither are contingent for salvation in the faith. Now, of course, deliberate sin that violates the law of love, you know, like we saw in the end of Romans 13, this, if it's not repented of, is, makes salvation contingent. And um, But issues of, uh, of eating and drinking and, and observance uh, to uh, particular days and circumcision or not, Though, of course, we're, we're maintaining that there's still uh, a place within the calling of God for those things. So he says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews to those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I may win those who are without the law. So under the law of Christ is assuming he's laying that out at the end of Romans 13, like we just talked about. This is the fulfillment of the law. And this is what Christ calls us to, to walk in love, because the law was simply given for transgression. And this is what he says in Titus 1. I think it's in Titus 1. What does he say? First Timothy 1, the goal of the command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm, right? So again, a reference to those within the circumcision group. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. So we know that the law, like Galatians 3, was added for transgression, and that these aspects of it and were, were under the uh, leadership of the Holy Spirit, the, the Gentile but that the law is good for instruction, like it says in First Timothy three sixty. Uh, what is it? Second Timothy three sixteen. All scriptures God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, which is what you get in Galatians three. That it's a, it's a tutor, leading us to Christ, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so evangelistic order, you have clearly in light of the delineation and callings, you have a delineation in the order of evangelism. And so, um, as Paul says that the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
for in the righteousness of uh, uh, right, for in for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So you have this all throughout the book of Acts, where Paul is always going to the synagogue first, and it's not just a kind of you know missiological strategy in which it's more effective to go to the synagogue to, but it's actually an order in which the the gospel is called to go to the Jew first because. At the judgment, like Romans 2, the judgment actually happens to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, and eternal life is administrated to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, where it says, uh, Romans 2, you, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself for the day of God's wrath, when, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each according to what he's done. To those who by persistence in doing good, who seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So you have the administration of the day of the Lord, and you also have the evangelistic calling in this age, which is reflected in a broad way in that Jesus came to only those within the house of Israel, and he sent the apostles out to only the lost sheep of Israel and the, 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 the what was it, a Samaritan woman who comes to the table and asks in the, but yeah, yeah, Syrophoenician. And so the, the, the there's the recognition that I, I am not sent to, to the dogs, but yes, Lord, the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And then it's it's clear for the first ten chapters, which is a significant amount of time in the book of Acts, that there's no place for Gentiles in salvation unless they become Jews, right? And so then you have the dramatic shift in, in chapter 10. So even in the broader evangelistic order, it goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And even beyond that, in redemptive history, when you look at Romans 11, he hardened the Gentiles to bring the, the Jew at first, and then he hardens the Jew and goes to the Gentiles. So even in redemptive history, from Genesis 12 onward, you have to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so we, we tried to flesh out you know, some of the reason behind that as far as what makes the Jew unique versus the Gentile is that... It's based on birthright or primogeniture as the eldest as the eldest son, and they have a a delineation in both stewardship in this age, but also in administration of the inheritance in the age to come. <clears throat> so uh, after meeting, I think this is Acts 13. Yeah. So after meeting, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. So you have Jews and those who are com Gentiles that have converted to Judaism. And they've gone through what we were talking about. They follow Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So they're preaching to the Jews that this is the means by which God sent his son the first time to bear sin. He'll send him the second time to bring salvation. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul, what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out loudly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And so again, you, you have an evangelistic order in which it was they were called and it was necessary. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Then Acts 18, you have the same dynamic where every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. 
So again, you have a clear delineation between Jew and Gentile in stewardship and evangelistic order, and you don't have one homogenous calling to evangelism, one homogenous calling to stewardship for Jew and Gentile alike. You have a distinction. <clears throat> so um, we've kind of worked through the no basis, no distinction in basis or quality of salvation. Obstacles to Jewish evangelism. So the offense of the cross and divine atonement. This is the primary obstacle to to Jewish evangelism. That was this is why you had the rejection because the message of the cross itself is offensive to the arrogant. Jew and Gentile alike, it's offensive to the arrogant because it says that you have no part in earning salvation. You are saved by grace through faith. And so to the downtrodden and the broken and those who have nothing to offer, that's fantastic news, <laughs> you know. Like when I came to the Lord, I had in one year squandered 20 grand on, you know, my freshman year of college, I had squandered 20 grand on drugs and, and I had broken with reality for three months, you know, like I told you in the testimony. And, and so when I came to the Lord, like I, 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 I would spend like five hours in Walmart and buy like three things because I, I my mind was so fragmented and I couldn't make a decision about anything and everything was just so fast you know and it was just like and so like when the mercy of God was extended to me and it was made known to me and I received it and it was filled with the Holy Spirit it was just like this is freaking awesome you know and so it's great news to those who have nothing to offer but to those who believe themselves to have something to offer it's offensive, the message of the cross. How much more to a people cultivated in righteousness that it's difficult to, to those who are forgiven much, love much, but to those who are forgiven little, it's hard to love, you know, and it's hard to accept the message of it. And so, um, so Galatians 5, you have the, uh, the dynamic of the offense of the cross that Paul references. And uh, it's, the, it's the nature of salvation itself as a gift that the message of the cross is, is uh, offensive to Jews then and also to Jews today. <clears throat> All of sin fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put, por put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. So Romans 10, this is kind of the heart of the offense of the cross that's still a difficulty today. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Right? I Listen, I didn't grumble. The snakes aren't here because of me. I don't have to look at the snake on the pole. I'm good. You know, like, and you get bit by a snake and you die, you know, because you're we're all part of the same boat here, right? I didn't look. I didn't. I haven't worshipped other gods. I don't need to put blood over the door, right? You don't put blood over the door, you die. You don't submit to the divine prescription and the arrangement, you die. This is, your, this is how Paul is putting forward the sacrifice of the Messiah, that it's an ordained pattern that God knows the human heart and all have fallen short because that's what he's saying in Romans 3, right? This is what he's pressing on the Jew. He's not saying universally in Romans 3 where he says, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. Right? Verse 9, verse 10. As it's written, there's no one who's righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, not no one who seeks God. All have turned away, altogether worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice to see, poison of vipers on their lips, the mouths are cursing, their feet are swift to shed blood, etc., etc. Now what's he saying? He says, now we know that whatever the law says, all of this that he's just quoted, 
It says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. So when he's quoting all this from the Psalms, he's quoting all this to prove that Jews are under sin. Because look, God has said all this, and what does he say all this? He says these things to those who are under the law, if it's within the law. So I've just quoted to you and proving to you that God says that to those under the law that all have gone astray. So even in Acts 3, he, what he's driving at, the offense of the cross, is he's driving home that all have gone astray and all are under this arrangement. And there's only one name under heaven by which we are saved. And this is the way God has arranged it. And to, to the Jew that is arrogant and self-righteous, he says, I don't need this arrangement. Right? And this is the offense of, of the cross. And uh, so, uh, if you look up on uh, at the top of page 7 there, Romans 11, So I asked, did they stumble in order they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and to save some of them, or to provoke my fellow Jews. And so this is the heart of the provoking, is the message that you are saved by grace, Ephesians 2, as a gift, not by works, so that no man may boast. Okay, so that is the heart of the offense, and that is the heart of the provocation of the Jew. And I boast in my ministry in the Gentiles, and I make much of it to rub it in the face of my fellow Jews who are arrogant and who are being broken off, right? Because this isn't, if you work through all the Old Testament, you'll never find a, when, when God provokes Israel or Israel provokes God, it's never a positive situation. It's always a very negative situation, okay? So the provocation of the Jews is not like, Oh, if we just love them so much and show some of whatever and, you know, like they'll be provoked and inspired. And it's like, no, no, this is not what Paul has in mind. Paul has in mind rubbing in their face that they Gentiles have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's not based on their righteousness. It's based on faith because this is how God is. And he considers no man righteous. Even if you've elevated yourself and exalted yourself, God will bring down the humble at the day of the Lord. And he's expressed that in the cross and this arrangement for salvation. You see what I'm saying? So again, we and this is a very pertinent issue to evangelism of the Jews happening today because the primary approach to evangelism of Jews today is positive provocation. And there's, there's very little offense of the cross coming into vault. There's, there's always a downplaying of the cross. And there's always a look how much we have in common. And there's always a positive provocation going on in the midst of Israel and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the ministries that are happening, the messianic ministries that are happening in Israel. So there needs to be a shift in our evangelism to the Jews, back to the New Testament confrontation that God himself is picking the fight. If we want to back down from it and we don't want to be the voice, that's fine. But God is calling the church to pick the same fight that he's calling, that he's picking, because it's God who's provoking his people. Okay, and we don't have, to, there's no arrogance in it. We just have to be faithful in the witness that this is how we're saved, Jew and Gentile alike. And the provocation, the message of the cross in and of itself is offensive. But we, we don't have just one issue. We, we don't, it's not that we have just the same offense of, that the early church dealt with, which we do. We now, because of the Gentile influence, 
and all the baggage of realized eschatology and all of that that, you know, we saw. So, um, so we get, we get all of the nature of the age to come and the centrality of, of the Davidic throne and the temple and, and Zion and Jerusalem and Israel and the nations and the Messiah ruling from the river to the ends of the earth and this whole framework for biblical eschatology as it's framed out. And then a bunch of Gentiles come along and say, oh, well, yeah, all that was realized in the first coming with Jesus. And now there's, right? And so now we have a whole, a new kind of offense. And this is the one that's most like, you know, there's been a dialogue that's been going on between between Jewish scholars and Christian scholars, especially since the Holocaust, mainly centered around Germany. And, and you kind of have this kind of like, wow, that was really insane that happened. Maybe we should reach out to the Jews and try to establish some peace and dialogue. And so you you had this thing, that this Jewish-Christian dialogue that started after the Holocaust and really developed with the rise of 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 Israel after World War II and, and Jewish scholarship between Jew and Gentile. And so the dialogue is really interesting because the dialogue goes back and forth and the, the, the Christian scholars, they just, they just put away the offense of the cross. They just, they don't talk about that at all. And it all becomes, it all revolves around the dialogue about eschatology and what the two sides are hoping in and what the second coming is about. And so it becomes real clear and sharp where the Jews are like, look, this is what you believe as a Gentile and as a Christian. And this is what we believe. And we cannot believe what you believe. This is the difference between Jew and Gentile. All right. So we're, we're going to get it. So David Ariel is, he's the, he's the head of, he's the chair of Jewish studies at Oxford, right? So this is, it's not just a random fellow we're talking about. So this is one of the main Jewish scholars in the world. And so you get just a, what is it after all that marks the difference between Christians and Jews? Jews believe in the eventual fulfillment of an elusive dream of a perfect world. Christians believe that the world has already been saved by the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah Jesus. The difference between the belief in future redemption and realized redemption is the chasm that separates Jewish from Christian thinking. Okay, so you have a offense of realized eschatology in evangelism to the Jews. And so this is one of the dynamics that if you come up to a Jew and you get in a dialogue and you say, no, I, I believe the Jewish eschatology. They're like, well, you're a strange Gentile, aren't you? You know, and you can get along to the point of how do we inherit that eschatology, right? And the Jew's going to say, well, you inherit it by becoming a Jew and practice the law and remain faithful. And you say, nope. That's not how we inherit it. And then we have an offense of the cross, that that's the core of the issue. But we have a twofold issue now to overcome that the early church didn't have that twofold issue, right? Because the early church didn't believe in realized eschatology. I hold the same hope as these guys, right? Acts 24 is when Paul's talking to the Pharisees. I just try to keep my conscience clean. So, um... Backside, this is uh, a couple quotes of, of major Jewish scholars that were in Germany. And uh, a lot of their works aren't translated in English. So this is a quotation from Jürgen Moltmann, who was is real involved in the Jewish-Christian dialogue and the translation of his work into English. So you get a translation of what he quotes in English. So the Jew is profoundly aware of the unredeemed character of the world, and he perceives and recognizes no enclave of redemption in the midst of its unredeemedness. The concept of the redeemed soul in the midst of an unredeemed world is alien to the Jew, profoundly alien, inaccessible from the primal ground of his existence. This is the innermost reason for Israel's rejection of Israel. 
not a merely external, merely national conception of messianism, right? It's not that, it's not even so much that they've rejected the the ethnic aspects of salvation. It's that they've said salvation has already occurred. And this is the fundamental reason why the Jews continue to reject Jesus because the church is saying that your hope has already been realized at the first coming. And the Jews are like, so they start writing books called The Education of Christians, right? Where they like just start trying to lay out the covenants and try to talk sense to Gentiles that this is, the world is not redeemed yet. And so uh, he says, uh, in Jewish eyes, redemption means redemption from all evil, evil of body and soul, evil in creation and civilization. When we say redemption, we mean the whole of redemption. Between creation and redemption, we know only of one cesura, the revelation of God's will. Cesura meaning a, uh, uh, a, uh, an insertion into the middle of something, right? And so this is what Christians say. There's an insertion of realized eschatology at the first coming in the middle of, re- of redemptive history. We know of only one insertion, the day of the Lord, right? We the, the whole insertion of a spiritual redemption of the soul before a physical redemption of things, that thing is foreign to a Jew, right? <clears throat> so, uh, and replacement theology is so embedded into, into a saying that's realized because they don't have anything that, they, that they've been promised. So you're saying by nature, your promises have been, you know, revoked or whatever. Right, and so the greater the, the the greater offense, like he says above, not it's not the the main re- the innermost reason for Israel's rejection of Je- of Jesus is not merely external. It's not merely that you've realized all of the ethnic aspects of the temple and the city and the land, but that you've realized the internal thing, and you've said it's already started internally. We we don't. We don't have any of this. We don't have a spiritual kingdom going on before the messianic kingdom. We just have the prophesying of the day of the Lord and the coming of the Messiah. And we say, no, look at Isaiah 53, look at Daniel 9, you know, for the sealing up of, of, of prophecy and to make atonement for sins and these things, and you have a progression of weeks and a cutting off the Messiah. Look at of uh, Psalm 22. Look at the calendar and the Passover in relation to to tabernacles. Look at the sacrificial law and and its correlation with Isaiah 53. It is there, but it is ordained by God uh, to to a, a a mystery to some degree to hide it from the self righteous. And so this is it's it's not readily apparent, whereas the day of the Lord in the eschatology is readily apparent. And so the church never has a realization of salvation at the first coming. It's simply there's an ordained sacrifice before the ordained salvation. And this is why Paul can go from synagogue to synagogue, and he can lay out in three weeks, and many Jews can accept it. They would never accept any kind of realized eschatology. Never. Never. But they would accept, look, there has to be a greater sacrifice for sins that not only cleanses outwardly, but cleanses inwardly for the conscience. So Martin Buber is a very well-known Jewish scholar, and this is a little bit more like technical. The church rests on its faith that the Christ has come and that this is the redemption which God has bestowed on mankind. We, Israel, are not able to believe this. We know more deeply, more truly, that world history has not been turned upside down to its very foundations, right? Isaiah 24, I will shake the foundations of the earth. The earth totters to and fro like a hut in the wind. Like We know to our core the day of the Lord has not happened, that the world is not yet redeemed. We sense its unredeemedness. The church can, or indeed must, understand this sense of ours as the awareness that we are not redeemed, but we know that, that, that it is not. The redemption of the world is for us indivisibly one with the perfecting of creation, with the establishment of the unity which 
which nothing more prevents, the unity which is no longer, longer controverted, right? The, the, the unity of the salvation of creation isn't controverted and undermined by a secret realized redemption at the first coming. <clears throat> and which is realized in all the protean variety of the world. Redemption is one with the kingdom of God in its fulfillment. An anticipation of any single part of the completed redemption of the world, for the example, the redemption beforehand of the soul, is something we cannot grasp. Any, it, although even for us in our mortal hours, redeeming and redemption are heralded, but we cannot perceive no caesura in history, an insertion of redemption in history. This is you know, one of those technical terms that goes back and forth in the dialogue. We are aware of no sinner in history. We're, this, so this is a reference to Oscar Coleman and the sinner of, of the timeline. But it, anyway, only its goal, the goal of the way taken by the God who does not linger on his way. So again, we, the, the, the New Testament has no idea, right? Like you, you flip open first, uh, first Peter one, right? So there's no idea of some salvation of the soul that's already happened. Uh, there is a, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. In his great mercy he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, into an inheritance that never that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you grace you greatly rejoice. Now for a little while you have many you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so your faith is greater in gold, may, though perishes, even refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, and then he goes on, you know, the sufferings before the glories, therefore set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus. So there's always in the, in, in the New Testament, it's always still the future salvation that we're to receive in Jesus that we're to set our hopes on. Only now we've received reconciliation by the sacrifice, by the bearing of sin, and the confirmation of the Holy Spirit, Romans 5. Now we have peace with God through faith that we've been justified and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Like we receive the confirmation that we've, we've been reconciled to God, that there's a sacrifice that cleanses us in anticipation of the day of the Lord. So this is, this is, uh, we have a twofold dynamic. Uh, hold on. I'll, there's a twofold dynamic in our, in evangel, Jewish evangelism today that we didn't, that the early church didn't have to deal with. They didn't have this idea of realized eschatology. So we can come along and we can open the door and say, look, we, we understand the Jewish scriptures and we're Gentiles. We understand our place in the Jewish scriptures, right? And we understand your place. But there's still the issue of how do you, how do you receive eternal life and how do you receive your part in salvation? And there's still the offense of the cross. And that's the one that really needs to, on the Gentile end, you know, the church, the Gentile church on this side, we have to deal with the offense of realized eschatology. On the Jewish side and Jewish evangelism, we have to deal with not putting away the offense of the cross. The problem is even in, in Messianic Jewish circles, there's also the realized eschatology circling around too. And so... Deal with both. Is our, our language we've been using uh, more than inaugur inaugurationalism or realized eschatology is kingdom now or kingdom now not yet? So could you just clarify that's all kind of the same? Yeah, it's all it's all basically the same thing. You have different words for it: realized eschatology, inaugurated eschatology, kingdom now, dominionism. All of these are one form or another of saying what the Old Testament prophesied about the hope of salvation started at the first coming. The hope of the kingdom, of the resurrection, of all these things, that thing started at, at the first coming. And this we say, no, these things didn't start at the first coming. He came the first time to bear sin. He'll come a second time to bring salvation. 
And that's all that the New Testament and the controversy in the New Testament, the page after page and the butting of heads is never around what salvation is. That, there's never big, long diatribes about that. That's assumed, except when you're dealing with the Gnostics, which you get in like 1 Corinthians 15. The butting of the heads is over how we inherit that salvation and justification by faith. That's the main controversy in, in the New Testament. When for a Christian to say that you know they they are redeemed, is that kind of like wrong, or is it if they say like yeah I've been redeemed already or something like that? Um. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So we can say we've we've been justified by the blood of Jesus. This has happened presently between us and God. But the point of that is that that thing is happening in anticipation of the justification on the day of the Lord and the acquittal of sins on the day of judgment, right? So there's a real thing that happens here, but that thing is, anti is, is only means something in anticipation of the thing to come, right? So we've been justified, Romans 5. How much more will we be saved from the wrath of God? And so we know that if God did this, and this is how he relates to us, and we have the assurance of the Holy Spirit, then we know that this is how it will play out on that day. And so, yeah, we can, and, and this is just kind of part of the terminology of, of working around it and using past tense language like Ephesians 2 does real heavily. You know, we've, we've, we've been saved, we've been seated with him, whatever. But it's always understood in the anticipation and the surety that in the coming ages that the God will be glorified for his kindness. Right. Right. So again, we're not like, again, we're not crossing every T, dotting every I, have to have a perfect thing. We're just saying, look, the kingdom hasn't, like, there's no temple and glory and angels aren't ascending and descending and the heavens aren't open and there's no nations coming up to Jerusalem and, and there's no lion laying down with the lamb and there's no renewal of all things. Like this thing hasn't, and you can't have like a secret, you know, kind of spiritual starting of it apart from a physical, like where do you break that down? How do you open up Isaiah 40 and get out of that a spiritual inaugurated kingdom and a physical kingdom yet to come? There's no exegetical basis for that anywhere. you know. So we're just trying to talk reasonably and we can use the language of past tense and anticipation of the future and we can use the language of surety and we can talk in these ways and, and we can rejoice in the Holy Spirit and it can be a first fruits of the final harvest, but we don't need to say that it was the final harvest already that is not yet. No, it's just the first fruits of the, and it is the powers of the age to come, but it's not the age to come, right? So because we want to keep in delineation a clear, a clear simplicity of what is going on in this age, waiting at the right hand to make his enemies his footstool, versus what's going on in the age to come and why the two ages are different and what's the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the church? to testify that he's the judge of the living and the dead, and him is forgiveness of sins, to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins to all the nations before he returns, right? So this is the purpose that we give ourselves to. That way we don't start involving in ourselves in all of these games of realizing the glory to come in this age, right? And so we don't, you know, we don't start living for this age and setting our hope on this age and doing all the stuff that if you live for this life, you will lose the life to come. If you live for this world, you will not inherit eternal life. You know, the hardcore sayings of John 12, Luke 14, Matthew 16, like the really cutting, if you, if you gain this life, you will lose the next life. You know, just the really hardcore death to self and death to this life saying that always get brushed aside. And you never hear anything. So we want to keep those at the forefront and keep the ages clear and keep a kind of common sense framework. Right. So that delineation is really, like, if you guys are getting what he's saying, that this age and the age to come, they, in your mind, you have to know them apart with the delineation, the dividing line at the day of the Lord, so that you 
actually live and fear the day of the Lord. If, if there's no, if you blend it together, there is no day of the Lord. It doesn't matter how you live in preparation for the day of the Lord or whatever, because it's all been realized and it's all confused as to some parts are here. It's just like you just gotta have a plain linear sense of history. Right. Yep. Uh, my question is more like because you're, you're emphasizing on the evangelization of, 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 of Jews. So my thing is like, if, if we as Christians in the, in the Christian Western mindset and everything, don't the, we don't even have the Hebraic mindset or worldview of eschatology. Uh, my question is, how, how do we know that the Jew, the, the, the modern day Messian, or Messianic or Jewish mm-hmm. Jews have that same mindset since it's been 2,000 years? You know what I'm saying? Like, since the temple was destroyed and since they became just very pharisaical and everything else. Like, how do we... I know it makes sense for Paul in that day, but, like, what about the complications of now not... Uh, us barely even understanding that their worldview and how do they even... Yeah, I mean, you know, like like Hans was saying, he, he said, talk to an Orthodox Jew, and he didn't even believe any of that. I mean, he was just completely liberal, and, and it's like, yeah, you got the watering down, but and the law is a good tutor it really is and the 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 testimony to that is the fact that christians are even talking about a new world and a new earth and a resurrection of the body because most of that is jewish scholarship coming over to the christian church in the last century that started with albert schweitzer and johann wies and these guys going look Jews of the first century didn't believe in the Platonic heavenly destiny, and they didn't have the Hellenistic mindset and 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 all this stuff. And so the law is a good tutor, and the law will discipline under the sovereignty of God. And we just have to remain with grace and compassion, and somebody's inherited a bunch of kingdom now theology or, or, or language, and but... They know the mercy of God. Their heart's set on the cross. They love in Jesus. And yet there's still this, the main emphasis is the, the, the preaching of the cross and repentance and forgiveness of sins. And, and the main emphasis is on the return of Jesus and the blessed hope and these things. And yeah, maybe they're still a little bit already not yet in interpreting miracles and, and the activity of the Holy Spirit as the age to come. And, and it's like, well, yeah, that's fine. We can, you know, we can get along. It's it's when you get the hardcore. Therefore, let's start raising a bunch of money. Let's start establishing ourselves in the businesses and taking over the government and start writing out mission statements, right, about the seven spheres, like, right? There's a reason that evangelicals are on the watch list for the whole national security administration watch list you know conservative evangelicals are at the top why because they have written out statements that say our goal is to take over the seven spheres and the government well if you're the government what are you gonna think oh yeah i would watch them too the point is no that's not what we're doing in this age we're not taking over the government we'll submit to the government because it's raised up by god whether it recognizes it or not but that is not our game that we're playing. And we don't take sides in one side of political debate or another. They both need to repent. They both need to live for the age to come. And I don't, that's just not what we're playing, okay? So that's my point, is not to get in a riled controversy over specific exegetical issues of specific passages. I'll go into detail on that. That's fine. The point is we want a broad boat that gets us from here to the day of the Lord so that we inherit salvation and eternal life. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So I just want to impart that to you that you hear all this and it's like, oh yeah, all this is much more simple and straightforward. And and then you have a brother or sister who comes along and they get this, that, or, and you can go, well, you know, Apollos, listen, let's, let's, kind of, let's do a Bible study for a few weeks, right? With with Second Timothy four, great patience and careful instruction, we can work through the scriptures. And well, I, I, it's the kingdom's at hand. The kingdom's come upon you. The kingdom's within you. All three of these are really bad scenarios, right? These are not good things to put your hope in. These are things that should make you like 
fear God and the wrath to come and the fire to come and stuff because all three scenarios are very scary. And so we can kind of talk sensibility into the specific issues and work out the things over time and, and talk through and, and love one another along the way and actually see people put their hope in the cross and save from the wrath of God to come, right? Because you, you, you get in those hardcore movements, there's nothing about the cross going on. And I'm telling you, there's not a lot of people that are going to be saved out of it. I, I'm, I don't want to be, I, I'm not like casting judgment. I'm just looking at it and saying, if you never talk about the cross and the wrath to come, it's most likely that when you stand before him, you won't be talking about the cross. You know what I mean? That is all I'm saying. I, I'm not like. Oh yeah, I just had a question. Like, when it comes to like um, um, balancing like just our view, like um, sometimes like I find like uh, the Dominion theology like yes is wrong. Like we're not here to take over the world, but like sometimes I feel like the weakness and kingdom to come is like disengaging with society. Like almost Christians taking like. A monastic perspective, like we shouldn't engage and be salt and light. So, what what's the balance? Like, we're not trying to take over, but how should we like even engage in in our society? Like, just to be a testimony, a witness to the Lord and righteousness. But um, we're not trying to take over, but we're not trying to draw back into a monastic lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you nailed it. It's it's the issue of witness, which draws from the prophetic tradition. And, and being a witness for the Lord. And so we, you know, you had the two main emphases of perversions of in the early church. You had the heavenly destiny, and then you had the kingdom now, manifestation of sovereignty, right? One led to the monastic movement for a thousand years. The other led to the Christendom movement with Constantine and all that. And the two were fed in, in both directions. And so whatever your whatever your end game is, that's what you're discipled unto, right? You're discipled according to destiny. So if your end game is floating on a cloud in the eternal sing-along, you're discipled into that thing, right? And you live now as you will then. You live as in the daytime, whatever your daytime is. Or if your end game is a manifestation of sovereignty, and that's what God is doing, taking over the earth from the beginning, and you live according to that destiny and you manifest it and you work towards it and you disciple yourself towards it and you, right? And that's what you're after. So we don't want either one of those. We don't want to take over the world and we don't want to float on a cloud forever. We want to walk through this age testifying and setting our hope on the age to come. And so in any given situation, what is our response to unrighteousness? Flee the wrath of God to come. Repent, because the day of the Lord's at hand. And God will judge wickedness and unrighteousness. And the way that you're saved is that you repent of whatever you're doing, whether it's immorality, whether it's oppression, whatever it's greed, idolatry, whatever you got, whatever in that specific situation, the depravity of man has perverted a human being, you give it the same message. The day of the Lord's at hand, and you need to repent of your unrighteousness. And if you continue in that sin, you will bear it forever, right? And so you give a prophetic witness. Therefore, you'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. So the primary task of the church is not to separate and, and disengage from the material world. The task is not to dominate and take over the material world. The task is to sojourn and witness to the day of the Lord and to Christ Jesus and save people from the wrath of God by putting their faith in the cross. That, does that help? But it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's the exact opposite of disengaging with the world. The cross is the engagement with the world. That's what the cross is. That God didn't cast off his enemies. That God didn't just crush his enemies that God engaged, incarnated, and died for his enemies. And so the church is called to witness to this is how God is in his kindness, and this is how God is in his severity in the day of the Lord. And we're to witness to both the kindness and the severity of God and repent and flee the wrath of God to come. And 
Uh, one question. Uh, when you witness or you evangelize somebody, uh, there are two two way uh, two main factors. One, as you say, the day of the Lord, the wrath of this, that the love uh, of Christ, the love of God. Mm -hmm. uh, so how? What is the balance? What is going to be? Because for for uh, unbeliever. Uh, if you talk about just the wrath of God, the day of the Lord, forcefully, uh, you might turn him yeah, off. Or right? Walk away. Whatever. Walk away, uh -huh. and then where the love of God on the cross comes in. Which one? Uh, well, if you just talk about the love of God and not the severity of God, you get the seeker-sensitive bit. And it's just like, oh, God loves me and wants to bless me, and all this and then you then you get any kind of difficulty so it should be balanced both right so you yeah i mean it's so this is why we work through the 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 cruciform apocalypticism is we want to hold in tandem the severity of god and press upon people you know that i love <laughs> i love great comfort where he'll just take people and if you're, you guys have seen Ray, where he'll, he'll engage them. Hey, you're a good. Oh yeah, I'm a fairly good person. Do you lie and cheat and steal? Oh no, I don't lie and cheat and steal. And then, and then he'll he'll kind of draw them in and he'll ask him a question and force them in. And then all of a sudden, oh well, I am a liar and a murderer and a pervert. Well, you're right. Well, do you think God's going to accept you? Well, probably not. Well, you think you deserve wrath and judgment? Well, yeah. Now that you put it that way, probably so. Well, do you think you can pay for it? No. Well, this is what God has done for you, and you have to accept it as a yeah, gift. Yeah. And you know what I mean. And it's yeah. like He He draws people into yeah. the depravity of man. He draws them into the holiness of God, and He dra and He delivers them from the wrath to come. It, it's not really on a, you know, it's kind of on a heavenly destiny a lot. And it's the day of the Lord's universalized upon death rather than being held for judgment on the last day. You face judgment when you die and, and go to heaven, which. The, yeah, we can work through this issue, but the main issue is still we have to press the severity of God. The severity is much more severe than we understand at the day of the Lord, and the kindness, likewise, is much more kind and merciful than we understand because we don't understand the depravity of man or the holiness of God. Especially when I uh, when I confront Hindus, uh, the severity of God and the wrath, the day of the Lord, they're frightened. They cannot understand that, and they're shaken. And sometimes they, uh, on the verge of tears, they cannot uh, think that God can do that much to them. Yeah. And then, after saying that, uh, uh, we come to the love of God. Right. right. Yeah.